Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your weekly libertarian podcast from the magazine that has no plans to buy parlor. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and a limping Catherine Mangu Ward. Heidi ho, y'all. Howdy. Hey, Matt. Howdy, Matt. Howdy. Wow. Happy Monday. Howdy. Well, Howdy I don't even Monday? know who I am Monday. this week. Yeah. Happy Monday. Uh, Catherine, everyone. I was just down at, uh, before we get started, I was just down at um, Liberty Con, the annual conference, sort of annual conference, depending on the pandemic, uh, hosted by Students for Liberty. Uh, and a lot of people were expressing worry and anxiety about you because you were unexpectedly absent due to a horrific injury. What happened, Catherine? Yeah. Well, so <laughs> I was I was uh, on an e-scooter listening to Justin Amash's podcast when I oh hit <laughs> when I hit a pothole and fell and absolutely broke my kneecap and now I can't walk or do anything. I am podcasting from my bed. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it hurts. Uh, just hearing about can it. you just if you're retracing your steps? <laughs> uh, where do you? S- I don't. I have no steps now. I have nary a Where step. <laughs> do you see the decision matrix breaking down? Is it like just being in D.C. and thinking that riding scooters is okay? You know, I actually had an incredible parenting moment about this, which is that um, <laughs> I was uh, explaining to my kids what happened, and they, one of them, said. Oh, so like the problem is that the government didn't do a good job of paving the road. And I was like, yes, that is the problem. If my roads had been private, maybe I would still have a kneecap. Um, it's a stretch, but that's what, you know, I'm I'm just working yeah, with what I got here. The, uh, I feel like uh, you're blame when shifting. Yeah. talking about this at Liberty Con, and we will get to the podcast here in a moment, um, with uh, Reason colleagues Robbie Suave and Christian Britsky. Um, uh, and I was making the usual uh, offensive cracks against people who ride scooters in D.C. They then got to their phones to show me all the damage they've done to their face. Robbie said something yeah. like, oh, I've been hit by a car five times. Um, it yeah. Seems like you guys are doing something wrong. They're so fun. <laughs> I will ride again, Matt. I will. Uh, Matt, have you ever ridden a scooter? Only... Um, only non-mechanized scooters back in late 1970s California, um, like the ones the little kids wear now or well, ride now, and it had tassels, red, white, and blue tassels coming from the handlebars, like USA. a man. USA. Uh, all right. We're going to get to uh, talking about voters' stubborn refusal to prioritize what Democrats and the media want them to. But first, oh, that was loud. A word from our sponsor, Donors Trust, the tax-friendly way to simplify your charitable giving without compromising your values. Friends, is cancel culture coming for your charitable giving? Big banks are increasingly reluctant to allow charitable savings accounts, or donor-advised funds as they're formally called, to direct money toward libertarian or conservative nonprofits. The list of charities that have been recently rejected by big banks include the Atlas Network, National Review Institute, the National Rifle Association Foundation, Liberty Council, and others. To help ensure that your dollars support your values, come to Donors Trust. Donors Trust is built to serve people who want to put money behind their beliefs, limited government, and constitutional rights. To learn more, download a prospectus at www.donorstrust.org slash reason. And if you already have a donor advised fund, please consider opening a rollover account. That's www.donorstrust.org slash reason. Align your giving with your values. Visit donorstrust.org today. You'll be glad you did. Okay. It's uh, not just the waft of pumpkin spice in the air. No, that pungent aroma is the smell of flop sweat coming from Democrats with three short weeks between now and the congressional midterm elections. Here's a fresh headline from this morning's New York Times. Republicans gain edge as voters worry about economy, Times Siena poll finds. With elections next month, independents, especially women, are swinging to the GOP despite Democrats' focus on abortion rights. Disapproval of President Biden seems to be hurting his party, end quote. Uh, Or as a more 
caustic headline writer might put it. This just in midterms are midtermsing. Uh, there's been a bunch of polls out the past few days, including an interesting Harvard Harris survey that can be crudely summarized as saying voters' priorities are not the same as MSNBC's. Catherine, why don't you lead us off in grabbing the interesting poll nugget of your choice and perhaps maybe um, just tell us your level of enthusiasm preemptively as people get uh, ready to blame the ladies once again for enabling fascism. Oh, I didn't know I was going to get the lady question right up top here. Yeah, well, I mean, no, it's fair. It's fair. Um, So I think that, you know, I'm always torn on these poor results because on the one hand, I love to have voters just generally be mad at whoever is currently in power because they are right to be mad at whoever is currently in power. On the other hand, it is not going to be a solution to put this other batch of idiots in power. Like Republicans are not going to fix inflation. Republicans are not going to make your pumpkin spice coffee cheaper. And uh, they don't have the power to do that for the most part. Now, of course, policy matters. Um, And I did, I would say the tidbit I liked the best from this poll was the fact that um, all of the Biden kind of stimulus payments, support payments, inflation offset payments, all of those, all of those payments are not polling well. People are not saying like, ah, yeah, that's really what I needed in this moment. So they are both not electorally helpful for the people doing them and are counterproductive economically. That's a that's a real win. Great work, everybody. But yeah, I, I think I don't think this is going to be a blame the ladies cycle. Do you? I, I think I think it's going to be I mean, we're white women are bad, I guess. But but I think that this is definitely going to be much more of a like very, very classic. The economy is bad. The party in power is in trouble. And as you say, midterms are midterms. This is uh, uh, the preemptive blame the ladies thing. Here's a little bit of a verbiage in the New York Times piece from today. Uh, the biggest shift came from women who identified as independent voters. In September, they favored Democrats by 14 points. Now, independent women backed Republicans by 18 points. So, like, we're mad about abortion and now we're mad about inflation. Yeah. And we're right to be mad about both those things. So, screw y'all. Uh, Peter, you brought the Harvard-Harris poll to our attention. Thank you very much for that. What interested you there? So, in that poll and in the New York Times poll, I think what you're seeing is a weird kind of uh, – weird but also in some ways predictable – repeat of 1970s inflation politics. And so I, I spent a couple of months uh, earlier this year working on a big piece for the magazine about the the ways in which we are not exactly repeating the politics and policy mistakes of uh, of the 1970s. But it does feel like we're in some kind of like trance synthwave remix of them, right? Like it's like the same stuff just in a different order and with a slightly different beat. I mean, there's inflation and oil shocks. There's a foreign policy crisis or maybe several of them global disarray there's this sense that that crime is a, a real problem big liberal cities are a mess uh if you remember that dark weird speech that biden gave where it looked like he was kind of addressing you know the, the first order like the empire in star wars the whole thing was gloomy and kind of inexplicable and people were like what why why is he doing this right it was it was kind of sort of a version of the malaise speech it was like hey america we're in a dark place the malaise speech which notably did not ever actually use the word malaise but the other thing you see looking at the 1970s and the politics of the 1970s the economy of the 1970s uh, that is just really really apparent this morning in particular is that voters really, really, really do not like inflation. And I, if you go back to the, the polling on, on issues and the debates that were happening between Carter and, and Reagan, or the one debate between Carter and Reagan before the 1980 election, it was just far and away the number one issue going into the 1980 presidential election. Voters were really mad about inflation. And then like be, beyond inflation, they would be like, well, I'm also mad about the economy and about energy. And you know what? Those are those are kind of all the same thing. Uh, and when it's when inflation is high, it's just very difficult for incumbent politicians to deflect or shift blame. Uh, and that's what Carter tried to do. What Biden has tried, you know, to do as well. He's blamed Putin's price hikes, the pandemic, uh, everything but Biden's policies and political leadership. 
And the reason that politicians can't deflect blame is because rising prices are so plain to see. Gas and food prices in particular are just incredibly visible on something like a daily basis to so many voters. And I think that when people go to the polls in November, more than anything else, maybe not, maybe that's not the only issue that they're going to be voting on. But in some ways, inflation kind of captures all of the other issues. It's the one data point. And that's what is going to is going to decide this election more than any other single thing. Nick, what do you see in those uh, polls out there that have, is of particular interest to you? So uh, in the the uh, Cap Har- or Harvard Cap Harris poll, one thing that I found most interesting is less political, but um, they ask people what are the most favorable institu- or what institutions you have the most favorable opinions of. And the top three by a lot are the U.S. military, Amazon and the police. And that in itself kind of suggests that like where people are and where the media is are very divergent, Um, and which then has ramifications for a lot of coverage and a lot of the stuff that uh, both uh, Catherine and Peter were alluding to. The other thing, and this is um, from a summary of polls for ballot from Ballotpedia, Trump and Biden basically have the same unfavorable ratings or favorable ratings as uh, as the other had at this time in their presidency. But the difference was when in 2018, something like 40 percent of Americans thought the country was going in the right direction. Now it's down to like 24 percent, according to their averaging. And that's a huge shift, because if, uh, you know, political scientists have have mapped the first term midterms for the president's party. If the president is under 50 percent approval, the average loss in the House is something like or the median loss is like 37 seats. This is shaping up to be a really, really bad House uh, outcome for the Democrats. Uh, The Senate, it's more interesting because the Republicans really in a lot of kind of walkover states where they should have been able to win easily really have gone out of their way to uh, nominate just complete dum-dums. So we'll see. But it's not looking good. For uh, the Democrats, it's really notable how much Democrats have just abdicated all of the economic issues to the Republican Party. They're not talking about them or to the extent they are. It's like I said, it's it's Biden just blaming somebody else for problems or sort of saying, well, look at the the you know unemployment rate, which is uh, which is quite low. But if you look at this poll, the top five issues are number one is inflation. Number two is economy and jobs. Number three is immigration. Number four is crime and drugs. Uh, and number five is women's rights. The first four of those are regardless of what we think, you know, about Republicans and immigration, um, you know, or, or uh, Republicans in crime. The first four of those are all issues that uh, give Republicans an advantage and that Republicans have been playing up very heavily in, in advance of the vote. Hey, Peter, in your uh, research about inflation politics in the 1980 presidential race, did Reagan specifically say what he would do to combat inflation or did he merely are, you know, kind of say that he would fix it. Um, Because one of the things I I agree with, you know, Biden has he's tried to blame everything else, but he's also never said what he is going to do to fix it other than kind of say, like, I'm going to give people a lot of money. And I think most people understand that that's not going to fix the problem. That is the problem. But did Reagan specifically say, you know, I'm going to cut spending and, you know, push to increase, you know, interest rates while cutting taxes? Or or did he just kind of say, I would control things better than uh, than a mix of the two somewhere in between, I would say. So he had an inflation plan that was and an economic plan that was built around uh, tax cuts. Um, It was the the numbers were honestly kind of dubious when you actually looked into how the plan worked out. It was it was, however, something sort of specific. Um, But then when he was on the campaign trail and in particular when he was debating Carter, Carter would say, well, look, you know, there are all of these headwinds facing the country. Uh, We have, you know, in particular, we've got um, global economic shocks that are just really messing with the price of oil, that sort of thing. And he would, you know, sort of say other, you know, well, there are other problems, too. He'd basically say the thing that you can't say as president, even if it's kind of true, which is this isn't really my fault. And Reagan turned that around on him. And Reagan just delivered this. uh, It. Quite effective. I, again, I don't think perfectly accurate. I could like 
quibble with a bunch of the things he said, but incredibly effective response to Carter when they went at it on inflation, where he basically said, you have blamed just about everything else. You've blamed the Federal Reserve. You've blamed, you know, Saudi Arabia and oil shocks. You've blamed uh, Republicans. You've blamed just but you, what you have done, what you haven't done is blame the government for uh, it, it, the government itself and your policies and his and Reagan's sort of summarize. Um, I don't have the quote right in front of me, but what he came in sort of he finished this bit by saying the problem is that the government has been living too large and that that has made it hard for the people to live well. And it was, again, we could certainly quibble with the specifics. I don't think that the inflation plan, the economic plan that he put forward is, you know, just like it it was a was unimpeachable Um, at the same time. What what he did was he turned around the question and said, you can't blame everybody else. You have to take responsibility for this. And my my answer is don't make government the center of the solution. Catherine, um, I want to invite you to react to a couple of quotes from our president, uh, Joseph Robinette Biden, uh, Jr., and, you know, in light of the accusation here from our colleagues that he hasn't really been saying um, much of anything about uh, about the economy and inflation. So first one comes from a uh, stop at a Baskin Robbins in Portland, Oregon. Our economy is strong as hell. That's the first one. And then the second one is, is a uh, is a tweet uh, from Sunday. That's thank wow, you. That's such a good impersonation. Too, uh, Real American genius. Yeah. Um, second one is a tweet uh, from Sunday. If Republicans in Congress get their way, prices will go up and inflation will get worse. And then a couple of little carriage return spaces. And then at the bottom, it's that simple. It, it is not. <laughs> it is not that simple. Our economy is not strong as hell. And it is not that simple. I don't know. He seems wrong. Uh, the, the thing about these like off the cuff Biden quotes is that they are almost indistinguishable from carefully crafted Biden quotes like that's the thing that always blows my mind is like the dark Biden speech that Suderman was referring to earlier had lines of equal poignancy and craft. You know, I mean, it was just still absolutely like I will just assert stuff. And, you know, what this reminds me of, frankly, is Donald Trump, who also would just like say things, not back them up, maybe not fully finish the sentence and then just hope for the best. Um, it was like he was on a podcast all the time. It was like he was on a podcast all the time. I mean, we do that here, but like we're not the president of the United States for crying out loud. Uh, Nick, uh, you were talking a little bit about the gap between uh, media and voter concerns. I'm gonna flip that a little bit. Like one of the things media is obsessed with, um, and uh, we we frankly haven't talked about it as much maybe as we could have. Uh, the January 6th uh, hearings, right? Um, every day there's a new thing about uh, this number of Republicans, half, I think roughly, that are uh, campaigning in midterms or for whatever offices are uh, what uh, media frequently calls uh, election deniers. And, you know, every time you turn on CNN or MSNBC, you're going to hear the words January 6th and insurrection within the first 10 seconds. And that's clearly not front of mind among most voters. Um, but is there an argument and, you know, something like immigration is, on the other hand, uh, is there an argument to be made like, well, well, it should be more front of mind. And we're just doing our jobs to try to tell people what the important issues are. Matt, I would love to answer that question, but I'm still waiting on the final or actually the first investi- investigation of what happened in Benghazi. Mm, that's true. <laughs> you know? the, permanent, the, yeah. the permanent Michael select Bay committee I mean, on Benghazi is this, still And to be honest, January 6th is a lot like Benghazi, where for the people who are into it, it is all that matters. And the people who are insisting... That this is, you know, the, the this Rosetta Stone of all the perfidy of the previous administration for a thousand years. Uh, they're just writing themselves out of um, relevance to uh, to most Americans. Uh, January six was fucked up. It was stupid. Trump bears some responsibility. Uh, it was not an insurrection. It didn't work. The system held, et cetera. Trump shouldn't run for office again. He shouldn't be president. The Republicans shouldn't do that. All of, you can say all of that stuff. Nothing is going to come out of that that is going to, you know, change, make it more important to people, um, I think. And and to your larger point, it's just that the media um, 
you know, and, and particular subsets of the media are, are obsessed with it because that's where they are, but it's not where people are. I mean, we've talked about this before. This is January 6th continues to be the basket in which you know, a certain a certain type of commentator and a certain type of voter has kind of put all the eggs of like, people are going to realize that Trump is really bad. And we just have to keep talking about this. And they're going to realize that this is bad. And it was really bad. I will say like January 6th was worse than Benghazi. Definitely, in my view. But we don't need to we don't need to do that ranking for the most part. Um, because neither of those things are going to make a dent in the views that the other side has about the main character there. All right, let's shift gears a little bit. There's a lot of social media stuff in the news. We like to talk about it here on this podcast. Uh, there's reporting from the Wall Street Journal uh, just today that the insanely talented and perhaps talentedly insane uh, rapper, entrepreneur, and anti-Semitic conspiracy theorizer Kanye West is set to buy the freewheeling platform Parler, which, fun fact, is owned by the husband of conservative grifter Candace Owens who's been palling around with Kanye West, uh, where the two of them wearing matching White Lives Matter t-shirts. And yes, every single word I just said in the previous sentences would have been completely indecipherable to me 10 years ago. All this comes on the heels of news last week, which we covered a lot at Reason, uh, from the Internet 1.0 uh, money service, PayPal, they announced that they were going to start uh, deducting uh, $2,500 fines uh, from users who were deemed by PayPal. Uh, to be spreading, quote unquote, misinformation after an outcry, including from the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. They rebranded uh, the online payments processing company backtracked somewhat saying, well, we're only going to find you uh, and deduct from your accounts if you do intolerance. Um, Peter, to uh, paraphrase uh, the talking heads, what the hell is going on? Uh, with social media. And is this all just an expression of the beautiful marketplace of private censorship that you've been advocating all along? I mean, after all the things we've been through, I mean, after all the things we got into, I know some things that you ain't told me. I did some things, but that's the old me. Wow. That happened, huh? Yeah. So that's uh, that's Kanye West over a decade ago in uh, the great song Heartless on what is probably my favorite Kanye West album, 808s and Heartbreak massively underrated maybe not his actual best but my favorite i don't know man i don't what is what what opinion are we supposed to have about my opinion about kanye west is always and forever give me a new album that's it um the question was about social media uh peter uh, i was wondering if you could reflect on that but he's you're right so kanye west wants to buy a social media company elon what elon musk is buying twitter uh this this if nothing else this shows us that these things aren't st- uh, that uh, are that the the arrangement of social media power uh, is not stable, right? And so we have spent the last decade or so having debates in Congress sometimes, and certainly as pretty, sort of major parts of our political and cultural discourse about whether Facebook and Twitter are like so big that they will never ever uh, you know sort of be dislodged from their positions. And look, Facebook is like flailing into the metaverse. Mark Zuckerberg is really really happy that he added <laughs> legs. legs. This is this is I'm not making this up. Legs. There was like a whole Catherine like a, a day long press conference. I do. Yes, need. Catherine, this I... is for you. Mark Zuckerberg has solved your problem, Catherine, Thanks. which is that your avatar needs functional legs. And Mark Zuckerberg is like, here, functional legs. Thanks, buddy. This is this just ridiculous. This whole this app, this whole thing that the, the political debate we have been having about how these things are monopolies, about how they should basically be, you know, sort of uh, public utilities, quasi arms of the government that like Elizabeth Warren and Josh Hawley should get together to decide exactly which posts are misinformation, disinformation or, or you know, just sort of bad speech that they don't like about whether these things should be subsidized, owned by the federal government, nationalized, whatever it is. It's all dumb. It's all dumb because someday Elon Musk or Kanye West is going to wake up and think, ah, maybe I'll just buy one. And then what's going to happen after that? We don't know. We have no idea at all. And that's how the market works is we don't know how it will evolve. We just know that it will. And so any theory of of, of uh, any industry, but especially one that is so important as uh, as the speech industry, as the uh, as the allowing people to say things online industry, any industry, like any theory of that industry that says, actually, we've we've hit 
the the final form of it, right? This is the end of social media history and nothing will ever come after this. That theory is always wrong. Nick, uh, first, I would commend uh, 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 listeners to go check out your uh, great talk with Eli Lake about uh, all things Kanye. Um, I, I want to play our every podcast. Uh, Matt and Nick talk about, do you remember when? Uh, or I'm old enough to remember when? Okay. Maybe. Who's scared? Who's scared do for, for uh, yes. uh, all This better be about spaceships. MySpace. <laughs> it's about pay. It's about yeah. PayPal. Now, MySpace. I mean, uh, uh, we are old enough to remember yeah. when PayPal was a super libertarian, PayPal. newfangled alternative to yeah. all them fuddy duddy payments processing systems. And who uh, remind me, Matt? Who uh, who were the I'm two big mistaken, wigs of PayPal? It was Peter Thiel, and then some other dude. Uh, some kind of ruski whatever uh, happened to him uh yeah. but yeah uh can you just sort of reflect on that uh as like a a symbol of how many institutions including you know online only institutions have yep. just absolutely devolved from their original purpose an ethos yeah you know another one uh that came up around the same time was skype uh which was going to revolutionize and empower the world uh, with free audio, uh, free video calls, uh, which it kind of did. But the guys who created Skype uh, were Swedish originally. They moved to Estonia, but they, um, you know, they they uh, put out a, a manifesto about how this was going to change the world. Skype is now owned by Microsoft, um, so not quite, and you know, it has gotten its ass kicked by Zoom and a couple of other things. But I kind of miss that era. You know, when PayPal was going to bring, you know, it was going to be a new form of e-commerce that was going to, you know, it had a lot of, it, it was kind of, had a lot of whiff of Bitcoin, pre-Bitcoin, um, but it's not that way anymore. I want to introduce into uh, the conversation just the concept of what uh, Rob Long, who some of us know, he uh, does a lot of podcasts. He was the head, uh, he was the showrunner at Cheers for uh, a while writes for national review and commentary and other places but he was telling me recently that um you know the ambulatory psychotics <laughs> uh that we see walking around the streets of cities like new york la and san francisco have now, have now jumped to the highest levels of power and he's talking about like trump biden and <laughs> kanye west that they are ambulatory psychotics uh, and like He's not sure whether this is like the ultimate yeah. triumph of the disabled or a sign that we're going down the drain. But I like the phrase ambulatory. Yeah, uh, that's a, that's that's a keeper. Uh, Catherine, um, for a change, I'm going to read you a tweet. Um, this one comes <laughs> from <laughs> the uh, official uh, Twitter account of the House Judiciary GOP. OK, um, so the, the GOP, Republican Party, House Judiciary uh, committee. Uh, this is from October 6th, so pretty recent, and it's still up there. Three words, each with a period at the end. Ready? Kanye, period. Elon, period. Trump, period. How do you respond? <laughs> what the First of all, great lead. Dramatic opener. I like it. Uh, not sure that that level of literary achievement has previously been seen in that venue. Um, right. So I think there's this you know, always, always there's this weird thing in this conversation where it's like members of Congress are like, here's the thing we're really worried about. A small number of weirdos having a lot of control over things. And it's like, my guys, <laughs> it's you. Like, it's literally you. I don't like I just don't understand how straight facedly you can make this argument like a, an elite cabal of unusual characters is going to be in charge of what people can think or do or say like, it's you. The call's coming from inside the house. But they're a duly elected they're, by up to 25% yeah, like of the people they claim people to represent. people who woke up this morning mad about inflation are going to choose them. So I guess it's fine. Like, I, so there's that. There's just like my basic, you know, uh, if your worry is elite control, like Congress is not the place to solve that. But also, you know, I do, I do think, though I actually remain fairly staunchly in the you know, the the winds of creative destruction are going to continue to sweep through the social media sector and we're going to be fine. I do think there is there is a possibility for a bad equilibrium here that we should be trying to avoid. And that is one in which 
Um, we have de facto control over what speech is or isn't allowed, but it is done through the mechanism of the uh, decision makers at social media companies either trying to guess what the politically powerful want them to do or being told informally by the politically powerful what to do, who's allowed to speak, uh, on what terms they're allowed to speak. Um, and that all happens sort of one layer of remove from where anyone can see it, either shareholders or the voting public. And I, I think that that is a concern. Uh, and I think this is like a classic example of a place where we're sort of crossing into maybe a new-ish form of cronyism. Like it's a new-ish form of kind of collaboration between big business and big government in a way that does harm consumers. I think there are a couple ways out of it. One is just to, you know, to demand that their, you know, that users demand more transparency. And I think that that is already happening. You know, people can defect from products that they don't like, regardless of their knowledge about where exactly the sources of those bad decisions come from. And then also that we should, you know, ideally be electing public officials who don't think that it's their business to sort of pressure or ultimately coerce, um, social media companies about what, you know, what they're supposed to do. But I think there is a there is a kind of um, temporary, probably unstable, but nonetheless pernicious equilibrium that we seem to be headed towards. And I, I would like to avoid it. Um, I don't exactly know how your your press release that you just read there is going to help with that problem. <laughs> um, because the more that these individuals who own social media companies um, or who have big decision making power in social media companies feel targeted, um, you know, they're going to break different ways. Like some of them are going to break Jack and be like, screw you guys, I do what I want and then retire. And some of them are going to give in for the sake of maintaining the viability of their commercial enterprise. I would uh, add before we leave the topic, uh, commend people to check out a, a report by the Cato Institute um, uh, a week or two ago about uh, what they call jawboning, where the federal government, various agencies or politicians uh, go after, uh, try to uh, breathe heavily on uh, social media companies and other people to try to deplatform various people, including uh, pretty famously Alex Berenson, the uh, kind of uh, COVID skeptic. Um, uh, it was uh, kicked off of Twitter and other places. Uh, both Jacob Solomon and Robbie Suave have written about this a lot. Uh, and it is an increasing and still kind of too little, probably, uh, discussed factor in our political life right now. Governments telling people to um, kick people off their platforms. It's bad. They shouldn't do that. All right. We're going to get to our listener email of the week here momentarily. But first, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Friends, when you're weary, feeling small, depressed by the ever-shrinking days, overwhelmed by all that life is throwing at you, do you focus more on the problem or on the solution? Stressful situations often produce fight-or-flight reactions, but that's no way to get through every day in this thing called life. We need instead to train our brains into becoming problem-solving machines. That is where BetterHelp.com comes in. BetterHelp is customizable online therapy, super convenient and affordable, and ready right now to set you up with a professional counselor to help organize your noggin to become an organ that assists rather than a system that overloads. Here's what you do. Go to BetterHelp.com slash roundtable, fill out a brief questionnaire, match up with a licensed therapist, and you'll already get 10% off your first month. Don't like your first match, you can get another, and so on and so on. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash roundtable. Go there today. You'll be glad you did. Okay, reminder, end, end, send, whatever, lend, mend your queries to roundtable at reason dot com. This one comes from J.D. Brennan in Seattle. He writes, Noah Smith makes an interesting case, which he links below, that the TARP bailouts, that's the Troubled Asset Relief Program, see, I remember that, bailouts avoided a second Great Depression. What say you, Roundtable, Catherine? I don't know. I guess we give those guys a Nobel Prize. So that's something. Um, yeah, I, like this actually is a really hard question because... Um, Everyone who's smarter than me on this stuff seems to think that that sentence is kind of true, um, which is interesting to me. Like, I take that seriously when there's broad consensus about this sort of thing. Um, my, um, you know, 
my question is just always, what is the long term consequence? I think that you can both have saved the world from a Great Depression and maybe uh, in the long run have done serious damage that is yet to be fully appreciated. But that's me taking refuge in first principles at like a very uh, cowardly level. And I don't have a great answer to this question today. Nick Gillespie, what's your answer? Uh, no, I don't think uh, the the choices aren't between a, gr a second great depression or the policy was perfect or something like that. And there's no question that the TARP program did not, uh, you know, it didn't target the activity that it was intended to do. It didn't necessarily save a lot of businesses. It almost certainly hampered the recovery. Um, so I think that it, I think that's wrong. You know, the government did a lot of different things. We didn't have the decline. We didn't have the depression that we had in the 30s for a wide variety of different reasons, including the, you know, the fact that um, uh, national currencies are much more linked. They're based against each other and things like that. The economy is very different. So no, Peter, I don't, I don't you are both a uh, TARP critic and obviously uh, a <clears throat> DC statist. What's your answer? So I think there were a lot of mistakes made in response to the Great Recession, and the biggest, to my mind, was uh, was actually ARA, the uh, the Obama stimulus, the fiscal uh, policy response, which is just really badly targeted all throughout at very best. I think you can make a case that TARP worked in a narrow sense and on its own terms, that by injecting liquidity into the banking system, it kept the banking system from total collapse, from uh, from sort of failures spreading from one bank to another. And that unlike the Obama fiscal stimulus, which was very expensive, uh, the cost of taxpayers was basically zero because the money was all repaid, even if you can argue about exactly whether the, the rates that it was repaid at uh, should have been higher and some, some of this sort of thing. But I would say to that case, um, I have a couple of responses. First is that counterfactuals are just hard, inherently difficult. We just don't know what would have happened in the absence of TARP. Second is that there are serious legal and sort of mm, executive branch authority questions about TARP. Um, this was at minimum of an extremely novel policy. It was put together in like just a couple of days, it gave Treasury, uh, the Treasury Department, a kind of unlimited uh, power with not a whole lot of oversight, and that created its own problem. So again, not a, when I say not a whole lot of oversight, I don't mean zero, but it wasn't like there were sort of uh, folks from Congress in there, you know, uh, watching over day to day decisions. And so there were congressional oversight reports that were released. And I, I want to be clear, this is not like the Republican congressional oversight uh, reports, right? Uh, Elizabeth Warren was a channel was a panel member. And I was looking at some of the reports um, uh, over the last day, you know, in response to this reader's question. And the second one starts pretty much from the beginning. And it just says the panel still does not know what the banks are doing with taxpayer money. That's Elizabeth Warren and Jeb Henserling together saying we have no idea what Treasury is doing with hundreds of billions of dollars. Treasury places substantial emphasis in its letter of, uh, from December um, on the importance of restoring confidence in the marketplace. But so long as investors and customers are uncertain about how taxpayer funds are being used, the question uh, th they question both the health and sound management of all financial institutions. Uh, so it was a plan to give the Treasury all the power and hope that worked. Now, maybe, maybe you can say that it worked in this one case, that Ben Bernanke had studied the Great Depression and that we, we got lucky because there was a guy who actually really knew what he was doing there for once. Do we think that that's a sustainable plan going forward? Do we have maybe one or two other examples of that sort of plan going badly? So I think at minimum, it was sold poorly. It didn't really help ordinary homeowners. And it set a bad precedent because even if you accept that it worked this one time, it created really terrible incentives because it was with the reason it really didn't help ordinary homeowners was at heart. It was a bailout for banks. And what it basically said was, hey, banks, if you get big enough that your uh, that your continued operations are we consider them sort of uh, like deeply integral to the functioning of the US macro economy then if you're ever like if it ever looks like maybe you're going to fail the US government is going to step in and make sure that you don't 
that is a very bad incentive going forward. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, provide a little bit of a context that sometimes uh, gets lost as people um, present this as a uh, either prevent the Great Depression or not. This is what George W. Bush, pre then president, believe it or not, uh, said in September 2008. I forget whether this is right before the first vote on TARP or before the second, but at any rate, um, uh, people were panicking in Washington. People like Michael Bloomberg were saying, it doesn't matter what we do. We just need to do something, uh, et cetera, et cetera, confidence. This was a, you know, a, a widely respected, respected opinion that David Brooks is the world. were all saying it doesn't matter. We just need to do something. Here's what George W. Bush said. What would happen if we did not pass TARP? <clears throat> More banks could fail, including some in your community. The stock market would drop even more, which would reduce the value of your retirement account. The value of your home could plummet. Foreclosures would rise dramatically. And if you own a business or a farm, you would find it harder and more expensive to get credit. More businesses would close their doors and millions of Americans could lose their jobs. Even if you have good credit history, it would be more difficult for you to get the loans you need to buy a car or send your children to college. And ultimately, our country could experience a long and painful recession. All of that happened. <laughs> All of the things that we needed to pass TARP to prevent, because it wasn't, we're going to have another Great Depression. It was, we're going to have that, that I'm pointing at my computer that I just read to you. Um, we did have all of that. Um, uh, in direct answer to the listener's question, uh, like Catherine, I don't know. Um, I, it's, uh, the, the counterfactual is impossible to do. But I can tell you what uh, many people, including at Reason, in very thoughtful and detailed ways at the moment, struggling with the world going crazy all around, um, predicted would happen if you would do this. Uh, predicted that you'd be creating moral hazard. That's true. Uh, predicted that such uh, amounts of, of, of uh, government spending would uh, eventually cause, or sooner rather than later, cause the government to grow so high that it would put a drag on long-term growth. We'd go from the 2 to 3% that we'd enjoyed for decades to more like 1% to 2%. And that's a huge difference. That all turned out to be true. Um, uh, a whole bunch of, of, of negative um, side effects, including... Um, after a, a brief blip of uh, uh, austerity politics in the Tea Party wave, uh, including um, that uh, uh, there's basically you had blown to smithereens any sense of the restraints on uh, federal spending, which we have. Um, if, if we're being uh, very honest about it, that's gone. Um, uh, we created authorities uh, just random out, out of thin air. Like, uh, oh, TARP means that we can take over the car industry? Sure. <laughs> um, even though they specifically uh, tried to pass a bill doing that and it was uh, voted down. So those kinds of authorities and, the, and sense that the federal government could do anything it wants in a moment of crisis. Hmm. Has that come up since? Um, yes, it has. A Co couple of times. A couple bit. of times. We yeah. had during the pandemic. Although it's worth pointing out a thousand times for some reason. I don't, was it the CDC? I, I'm still, I can't believe it, um, was telling people that they can't um, kick people out if they don't pay their rent. Catherine, talk over me, please. Uh, I would be delighted to. Um, no, I was just going to say, I think there is a counter counterfactual, I guess, where we would have gotten to that place whether or not TARP had happened. That is the the kind of factors that contributed to our politicians and our political culture being ripe for the overreach essentially that TARP was if we hadn't done it then we would have done it in the next crisis um that's a very dark vision i suppose from a libertarian perspective but that basically we were we were already as a country in a place where we were we were one crisis away from just letting loose you know infinite spending, essentially infinite emergency powers, and that um, we had already done that in many areas, including national security. And so this was just uh, a natural next step. And TARP happened to be it, but it would have been something. Um, and that that still puts us in this same bad place, but doesn't necessarily mean that um, you know TARP was what uncorked it. One thing to also watch, which we did in real time at Reason as well, is that um, Barack Obama, after becoming president, and you look at the his speech craft in um, uh, early 2009 over and over again. Uh, he, he would keep saying uh, things like, uh, 
You know, when I took office, we were the entire global financial system was on the verge of a meltdown. Um, it's not true. He took office in January of 2009. Meltdown, to the extent of which it was hanging over everyone's head, was in the fall of 2008. It seems like that's uh, splitting hairs. It's not uh, because he used that to pass the uh, aforementioned uh, stimulus um, and uh, and also to uh, look backwards and bathe in a holy glow the decisions that his administration took or the ones that they kept from the uh, Bush uh, administration preceding and make it seem like um, it was more uh, dynamic, dramatic uh, uh, at the time than it actually was in real time. Um, the banks weren't melting down in March of 2009. Uh, in April uh, 2009. Um, so when people use the framing of we avoided the Great Rece uh, re uh, Great Depression 2.0, that really wasn't the stakes being set out at the time. So watch it when people are, are kind of uh, retrofitting uh, the stakes of a crisis uh, backwards. Um, they might be right. I'm open up to that possibility. Uh, but they're also rewriting what the stakes felt like at the time. It's worth pointing out. All right. Uh, very briefly, uh, before we get to our end of podcast cultural recommendations, uh, I just wanted to uh, highlight the fact that today, October 10th, no, it's October 10th, 17th, one of these days, <laughs> who knows? If I don't have my Google calendar in front of me, Nick, I just, wow. it's really hard to, uh, anyways, yeah. it's the uh, anniversary of the uh, authorization of the use of military force in Iraq, 20th anniversary in 2002, um, which was a mistake. Um, at the time, we shouldn't have used military force, shouldn't have authorized it um, and led uh, that's the legal uh, justification for the Iraq war. Uh, all of that terrible mistake. Um, and uh, also it should be repealed. And there's more movement afoot uh, in the House and the Senate to repeal it instead of keeping an open ended authorization uh, for force that's used in all kinds of matters that have zilcho to do with its original intent. Um all AUMFs. There's still ones in the books from Eisenhower administration. I think it's like 1957. There's like an open-ended one because we were worried about like communism in the Middle East. Um, we still kind of can use. Um, there are uh, Barbara Lee has some. Peter Meyer has some uh, various uh, bills out there to repeal these AUMFs. Um, uh, Rand Paul has been in favor of that. Should be done. Congress should do that. That's my editorial for today. All right, let's go to our uh, end of podcast what we have been uh, consuming in the cultural arena. Catherine, uh, besides pain-killing drugs, what have you been consuming? You know, I'm going to just go all in and say uh, the Justin Amash podcast, <laughs> which is, again, <laughs> what I was listening to when I went <laughs> ass over tea kettle. It was not Justin Amash's. It's so good it hurts. Would you say it's so good it hurts? Uh, I was listening to the Why, Matt who Fuller the episode, actually, yeah. uh, which is very good because I was meant to be interviewing Amash about the ways in which Congress is broken. Uh, Matt Fuller is a congressional reporter. I thought, hey, I'll, I missed this one. I'll listen to this one. So, um, But in preparation for this interview, I was listening to several of them. And it's a good podcast, guys. If you like this podcast, you are almost certainly going to like that one. Um, and, uh, you know, this, of course, uh, Justin Amash uh, always and forever represents the greatest challenge to my, uh, my deep belief that all politicians are garbage and will disappoint you in the end. Um, I sort of can't help but remain hopeful that, uh, that Justin Amash's story will come out with the happiest of endings, uh, in which he becomes, I don't know, president of the United States. Failing that though, he has a pretty good podcast and you should listen to it. Um, but I mostly want to put a request here. Um, I am going to have some free time to consume some media. And I would love recommendations from uh, from podcast listeners. Uh, you know, I g sometimes get these anyway, and I'm always super, super grateful for them. Um, but I, I need them now more than ever. Uh, my one plan is to consume absolutely everything in the Expanse series, both books and um the show, but Suderman has already talked enough about those. And so I will not talk about that much on this podcast. Other recommendations would be um, very welcome, especially something that's like a little bit funny. I would like some, some funny. Thank you. Uh, I recommend Catherine that uh, you can start at any time in your life. You should start listening to music. Mm, music is great. No deal. It's art for mm. the ears. <laughs> Uh, art for the ears. <laughs> Thank you for that one. very insightful analysis, Matt. You yeah. won me over uh, for music. There's a there's a backstory to that. I'll tell you someday involving communism. 
Catherine, were you fiddling with your phone when you uh, or why are you trying I to mean, blame were the you victim? Distracted no, I, while you were. <laughs> no, I mean I was distracted not, by I'm Justin just Amash's dulcet cause... tones. I guess, but no, I was. I it was a yeah, little bit. Uh, it was a little bit damp out, and uh, and so maybe mm. um, we can blame puddles, but we cannot blame my phone. Okay. Uh, Nick, what have you been consuming? Uh, so you mentioned Eisenhower at least once today, Matt, but I uh, consumed this great uh, exhibition in a coffee shop in uh, in New York near Tompkins Square Park, Ninth Street Espresso, uh, which bizarrely is on the intersection of 10th Street and Avenue B. But it's called 20th Century Artifacts from Another Timeline by an artist named John Tabot. And there'll be a link uh, where you can see it in Instagram. But basically uh, what the guy does is he imagines a different timeline from the one where you are uh, in where in the late 50s when um, Eisenhower had a heart attack. Um, as a result, his doctor, you know, takes care of him and then uh, suggests that he take LSD in order to kind of calm his anxiety about death after that. And then there's an alternative timeline, including where he uh, he doses Richard Nixon as well, who becomes president in 1960 because he's no longer like a bitter, horrible man. And and things just go off in a different direction. Uh, and it's very funny. Uh, it's very clever. Um, I disagree with some of, you know, the, the places where John, who I know slightly, uh, wants to go with things. But it's really great. And it's an imaginative exercise in, you know, imagining an alternative future, which is, in fact, a way of, or you know, an imagine. Uh, imagining an alternative present, which is a way of imagining a uh, alternative future. Matt, you'll like this in particular. Uh, you know, LSD in the 1950s particularly was used heavily to treat alcoholism. And p one of the subtexts of this series is that Mickey Mantle takes LSD in the 50s and ends up having like a 35-year career <laughs> as a result and ends up with the Houston Astros yeah. um, in like the 70s. So it's, it's, it's a very inventive, very funny, very clever, and I think very, uh, you know, low-key inspiring uh, kind of way to think about stuff. And it, it overlapped with the Horizons Conference, which is the oldest and uh, longest-running uh, psychedelic conference um, that – it's been going on for about 15 years where uh, business people who are interested in this researchers and then culture critics and whatnot all get together in New York in the fall. So 20th century artifacts from another timeline by John Tabo. Uh, it's really clever, funny and inspiring. It sounds like a, one of my favorite uh, uh, painting exhibitions I've ever attended about 20 years ago in LA. And I forget the guy's name. I'll look it up. Um, but uh, it was uh, scenes, including really large, like uh, uh, very uh, active um, uh, paintings about the war between Northern California and Southern California. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's just it's fantastic and, uh, and, and it breaks your brain in a lot of different uh, ways. Uh, There's a shift, if I may just quickly, yeah. uh, in New York, and I think I did this two weeks ago, uh, Wonderland Dreams, which was an immersive art project. This is kind of like that. I mean, it's much more interactive than a typical kind of art thing. And there's a shift going on. I think it's particularly intensified post-COVID of making art much more of an interactive process and whatnot. And I think that's all to the good because that's how we should be consuming all art anyway. Um, but, you know, this this kind of um, uh, turn really foregrounds the creation of meaning and possibility and kind of inspiration from art. So more power to it. Peter, what have you been consuming? I watched Werewolf by Night, a Marvel Comics special on Disney+. Plus. So uh, comic book guys out there, I know there are some in our audience, uh, will remember One Shots, uh, which is a, a just single issue stories not really connected to anything else. They're kind of out there, often out of uh, the continuity or sort of not directly related to the sort of mainline continuity of a comic book or a character. And kind of fun little footnotes or side quests, typically small ball stories, not big epics, but they were often some of the most fun things that Marvel released as a result because they didn't sort of bear the weight of uh, the, the, you know, sort of the mainline story. And that 
is what Werewolf by Night is. It's a 50-minute Marvel Comics one-shot in TV movie form. It's in black and white. Now, they originally shot it in color and like made it black and white afterwards and added digital grain, so it looks kind of goofy. But it's, it, it's kind of a tribute to the William Castle school of cheesy, schlocky horror films. And it's, it's just really fun, right? So the story is a, a bunch of monster hunters gather together to hunt a monster with the bloodstone. And there's an appearance by Man Thing, you know, who also known as Giant Sized Man Thing. Although in this case, they only refer to him as Ted, because that's he's not called Man Thing at all in the the show. And it's just it's sort of amusing and silly, and it doesn't take itself seriously, but also isn't like a a self aware parody of this sort of thing either. It's there's just the right amount of comic book werewolf monster movie schlocky earnestness you know for a werewolf movie it gets kind of hairy oh. inevitably but it's pretty good Boo. um Boo. so i'm gonna make uh, Catherine feel even worse um i saw one of the most moving pieces of art um that i i have seen in a long time um and uh, it's also something that uh the vast majority of people listening will have zero access to so I'm now exercising my libertarian privilege, um, which is to say, uh, while I was down in Florida, I traveled to the house of American hero Bob Poole, reasons long-standing uh, savior, uh, transportation policy uh, chieftain, uh, and so forth. Uh, lives over in Fort Lauderdale. I'm not going to give his address yet, um, but Bob has been known. Uh, over the years to have an elaborate model railroad set of his own design. Um, and I'd heard about this. I'd heard tell whispers. Um, but he and uh, his now wife, Lou, um, they were a contractual arrangement for a long time, um, uh, invited me to their house. And uh, and after uh, appropriate proceedings um, and, you know, I was made to follow the rules about <laughs> what happens when you go in. Three car garage converted into a incredible like diorama panorama 12D. It's not really um, uh, model railroad uh, uh, capturing of the year 1956 on a line that's on a steady incline from the Glendale Narrows part of Los Angeles to Santa Barbara, uh, including stops in Burbank and uh, in the Simi Valley and various places and passes and uh, street scenes. And and uh, did we go to Glendale? I forget if we go to Glendale, um, but in the, in the narrow, certainly. Um, I just, words can't describe. He spent 20, they have spent, but mostly Bob, uh, spent 20 years designing, um, tinkering with, creating l little trees with, in, making them by hand uh, with little orange trees because there's still some agricultural scenes in the valley um, uh, back then. Uh, just a remarkable feat of engineering, of dedication, of uh, obsession um, from someone who, like all good libertarian policy analysts, uh, advocates heavily against uh, foolish uh, train projects, such as the ongoing high-speed rail disaster in California, among other places, and just loves trains. Loves, loves, loves trains. And, uh, and it it's remarkable. Um, if there's any way of those, some of you who are listening know Bob, um, I would find find yourself in Fort Lauderdale. Find, get yourself to Miami. Sweet talk, the man. <laughs> it's designed totally for the space. It'll never be seen elsewhere. You unless someone you know pays twenty five million dollars for a hel helicopter and just moves it somewhere. Uh, it's not going to be shown in a museum. It is museum caliber. It's still not finished, but it's getting close. Um, just re remarkable, very moving, like American ingenuity and folk art at its best. I love it. Nick, have you ever seen the, uh, the, the situation? I saw an earlier <clears throat> iteration of it when, uh, Bob and Lou lived in, uh, Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, uh in the, uh, early to mid nineties, uh, in a house that, uh, Mr. William Shatner, who you may have heard of used to own. How's the swimming pool? Speaking of Shatner. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, I think drained, filled with sand. <laughs> As a health precaution. <laughs> it's not funny, but it's <laughs> yeah. That's where we are right now. Um. Anyways, uh, shout out to Bob and uh and uh and 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 uh you know ingenuity, art, and stick to itiveness. It's beautiful. Catherine, do you want to express your sadness that you made bad decisions in your life? I don't want the podcasters to hear me cry. Okay, fair enough. All right. Uh, if you like uh, things that we do 
here at Reason. Go to Reason.com slash donate. Uh, see all of our podcasts, including the Reason interview with Nick Gillespie at Reason.com uh, slash podcast. Nick, do you got some live ones coming up anytime soon? Some speakeasies? Uh, yeah, we do. Actually, on November 3rd, uh, we're going to have the great art designer and graphic designer Steve Heller, who wrote a memoir called Growing Up Underground, A History of Counterculture New York. This is a guy who started with the Free Press, New York Free Press and Screw Magazine in the late 60s, and then devolved into working for the New York Times and teaching at the School for Visual Arts. Uh, but he's a major, uh, a major figure in what art particularly counterculture art and magazines uh, looked like. Uh, but we're going to be uh, talking to him at November 3rd. And this week on The Reason Interview, it's a live, uh, it's a live interview we recorded with uh, Richard Reeves, the author of A Boys and Men, a great book from uh, the Brookings Institution Scholar. Beautiful. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you for listening. Send us your uh, your uh, emails. They've been uh, great and uh, interesting and thought-provoking at uh, roundtable at reason.com. Okay, goodbye. What's your